Hello, hello, and welcome uh, to our webinar. I hope you've had a really good day, uh, wherever, whichever part of the world you're tuning in from. And if you took part in last week's webinar, welcome back. We're so happy to have you back here. And if it's your first time joining, we are so pleased to have you with us today. In this webinar, we're going to be exploring how being curious can help us build relationship across divides and transform our approach to conflict. My name's Luke, and I'm part of the Difference team, which is part of Archbishop Justin Welby's Reconciliation Ministry. And I'm going to be co-presenting this webinar along with Victoria. Victoria, do you want to say hello? Hello, um, I am Victoria, as will be obvious by now. And I'm also part of Archbishop Justin's Reconciliation team. Brilliant. And uh, we're really excited for this webinar to be joined live from New York, the Reverend Canon Dr. Stephanie Spellers, who is Bishop Michael Curry's Canon for Evangelism, Reconciliation and Creation. Stephanie, would you like to say hi? Greetings, everyone. And I love that no one's ever introduced me as live from New York. So <laughs> <laughs> that works. It's great to be with you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, we are very excited to have you too. So just a few pieces of housekeeping uh, as we get started. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. So just be aware of that um, if, for any questions that you might want to ask and you can rewatch this on YouTube afterwards. If you're watching live, don't worry that if you can't see yourself on camera, that's the way that we're running this webinar and there'll still be plenty of chances for you to interact throughout. Uh, please do submit questions at any point, uh, whatever pops into your head, um, and use the Q&A function, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you have questions for a specific speaker, um, just pop that on the question, specify who it's for. Please use the chat for technical support. Uh, Kira from our team is available to help with any uh, queries you have about that. Um, and just to say that after the webinar, you're going to get sent a follow-up email that has a link in it to a feedback form. It'll take less than five minutes for you to fill out. It just really helps us understand how you found things um, and also just helps us improve and get better. So um, before we get going, uh, Stephanie, might I invite you to pray for us? Absolutely. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, your heart is a, is a heart of love. You have made us in love and you draw us closer and closer to one another across every difference, every division, every experience of strife and brokenness. Please, oh God, be with us in this very call. Equip us with these tools so that we can be your reconcilers, so that we can become more present, more curious, and open to transformation in every part of our lives. Thank you, God, for Archbishop Justin and his vision of um, a whole Anglican communion filled with reconcilers who bring that gift to our communities truly as ambassadors of Christ and his reconciling love. We bless you and we ask your blessing upon us in this work and in everything we do. We ask it all in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So by way of a bit of an introduction for us, um, so we work for Archbishop Justin Welby's Reconciliation Ministry, Victoria and I, and Archbishop Justin has a vision for the church to be a reconciling presence in the midst of conflict, to step into our identity as ministers of reconciliation, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. When we do so, we see new possibilities open up across our relationships. We see community flourish as we invite God into places of brokenness and conflict. We've created the Difference Movement uh, to share a way of being that makes this possible. How do we learn to do this stuff practically in a way that sticks and doesn't feel like an add-on to our faith, but an integral part of it? These webinars will explore the habits at the centre of difference, 
that can become a part of our everyday discipleship, allowing you to consider what it might look like for you to intentionally practice them in your own life. As part of the movement, we also offer the Difference course, which is a five session course for church based groups to go deeper in some learning about how we cross divides and disagree well and practice forgiveness in our relationships. We'll be offering some training events this autumn for those who'd be interested in running the course with other groups. And please do visit our website to find out a bit more information about that. The link is at the bottom of the screen and you can sign up for specific course training there. So now on to uh, why we're here today, what we're going to be doing. There are three habits that we teach that are rooted in scripture and seen in the life of Jesus that enable us to live out reconciliation. Be curious, be present and reimagine. In this webinar, we're going to go deeper with the first habit, be curious, sharing our understanding of it, how we can practice it across our relationships. We're then going to interview Stephanie, who's going to share some of her experience and wisdom with us. There'll be plenty of time at the end for any questions that you have. So a reminder to post any of these that you have in the Q&A at any point during the webinar. And um, a thanks to people who've submitted some questions in advance as well. That's really helped our thinking as we've been planning for this. So first off, I would love you to have a bit of a think about this question. What does curiosity mean to you? Let's take 30 seconds and um, I'd invite you to post your thoughts, what your answer to this question would be in the chat function. We'd love to see what understanding you're bringing into this webinar. So if you're willing to, we'd love you to share it on the chat with all of the panelists and the attendees. If you're watching this back as a recording, maybe have a think to yourself and you might want to jot some thoughts down in a journal or a notebook. So 30 seconds, start putting in the chat what curiosity means to you and then Victoria is going to take us forward. Wow, it is just fantastic to watch all these different responses coming in. And I don't even know where to start, really. Um, we have um, being interested and asking more. That idea of being interested is quite prominent. Um, an open attitude of wondering, being inquisitive, exploring and learning about the world, following through on something that you're interested in, and to not accept injustice, being interested, wanting to know. Wow, some really fabulous responses. Um, and it's really, really, really interesting to see um, how a lot of people are already in that space of seeing curiosity as potentially something that can bring depth and um, something really positive to our discipleship, to what it means to follow Jesus in the world. Um, we're going to unpack a little bit about what we, um, what being curious means to us, what we mean by that habit. And you've already touched on some of the real core of what that is. Um, firstly, we would say that being curious is about out stories. So it's about choosing to seek deeper understanding, to hear the story we don't know without judgment and without losing our own story or our own identity, but seeking to find out what is it like to be you? What does that mean? And in the face of difference or hurt or guilt or fear or hostility, our immediate reaction can be the opposite. We don't want to seek out the story. In fact, we think we know as much as we want to know. And being curious, does something completely new. It creates space for the relationship to breathe. It takes the pressure off. So we talk about seeking out stories. The second thing we mean by being curious is 
acknowledging that we aren't God, that we have our own limitations, every one of us. So when we're curious, we recognize that we don't have all the answers. And a lot of scripture is really dedicated to um, teasing out the, the limits of our own understandings and reminding us that we are limited. Um, so for example, the writer of Ecclesiastes says, no one really comprehends what happens on earth. Despite all human efforts to discover it, no one can ever grasp it. Even if a wise person claimed that he understood, he would not really comprehend it. And that's echoed in Job, in the Psalms, it's echoed by St Paul in Romans. Curiosity acknowledges that we're not infallible. It doesn't mean our story is invalid, but it means the other, another person, God, has something to teach us. We don't have a complete understanding. And going in with that humility can transform relationships. Finally, we talk about um, active rather than passive curiosity. Like I said, it was really great to see so many positive responses to what does curiosity mean to you. Um, we're aware that being curious um, hasn't always had the best ever reputation and it's not uh, unproblematic. And that's why this idea of active rather than passive curiosity can be really helpful. Now, I can't take the credit for um, coming up with that idea. Um, there is a professor called Dr. Roger Bretherton, and he's talked about curiosity in our spiritual lives. And he describes passive curiosity, which is more destructive, as kind of clickbait, that sidebar on the internet, which says seven things that will surprise you about George Clooney. Um, and it's about what's new. It's an obsession with novelty. Like what's in it? What's in it for me? Yeah, I just want to know because I want to know. And active curiosity is not an obsession with novelty. More often than not, it is looking again at that which we think we know or that we think we don't want to know. It's pursuing depth intentionally. It's got something to do with um, seeking seeking something deeper than what we've got at the moment, seeking to understand the other. So we're going to look at how we can practice this habit of being curious in our relationship with God, with others, with ourselves and with creation. Because as we began to touch on last week, those relationships all touch one another. So being curious in one relationship will often necessarily imply being curious in another. And as we go through that, um, it will be brilliant to be thinking, oh, what does that mean for me today? What does that mean for me tomorrow? Where does that have something to say to my daily life? So without further ado, I'm gonna hand back to Luke. Thanks, Victoria. So I'm going to take us through um, one of those strands of relationship, looking at what it means to be curious with others and why it matters. When we consider what it means to be curious, our stance towards other people might actually be the first type of relationship that we think of. There's something about human experience and story that captivates us. We see those that we share a common humanity with living incredibly different lives or holding dif different views, views very different to our own. Sometimes these differences might actually feel quite uncomfortable or even dangerous, which can cause us to withdraw. But our faith tells us that every person is made in the image of God. That means that they have high value and high worth. Everyone has a unique story to tell that's worth seeking out. Being curious means that we listen to others and we learn how the world looks through their eyes. 
how has their lived experience shaped their beliefs, their attitudes and their behaviour? When we're curious about their story, we affirm that person's innate God-given value and we open up the possibility to have a relationship with those who are different to us, to those we might have written off as that was never going to be possible. Jesus is the ultimate storyteller and he not only told stories but also drew them out of other people. In our last webinar we saw how he engaged with the Samaritan woman at the well in conversation. We see this happening again and again in the Gospels as he draws people into deeper relationship, inviting them to share of themselves. One such occasion is when he appears to two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus, which is in Luke chapter 24, verse 13 to 19. I'm just going to read that to you now. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. Let's just take a moment to think about this context. Jesus has just risen from the dead. He holds the most profound story ever told within his experience and yet his posture is one of curiosity towards his followers. So how can we do it? How can we step into this and practice curiosity towards others? In some of the questions that were submitted by you in advance of this webinar, you asked how we can practice curiosity towards others without it becoming intrusive or invasive. And the answer to this is, is really another question. What are our intentions? Are we being curious for our own gain, to win someone over, to win the argument? Or are we genuinely attempting to see the whole person behind that point of difference? Our focus needs to be on understanding the other person better rather than wanting to express our own view. It's the opposite of what Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls listening with half an ear. This kind of um, presumption that we already know what the person has to say before they've even said it. Instead, we need to give people our full attention. We can also notice the range of views and the diversity of people we surround ourselves with. Are the people around us challenging us and engaging us with difference or are they reinforcing our own views and identity, just the things that are comfortable? What do our social media feeds look like? Where do we go to for news and opinion? And if these don't feel like they're stretching our curiosity, we can make changes to the routines. We can also notice where familiarity with those nearest and dearest to us has dampened our curiosity. It's easy with the people we feel like we know inside out to imagine, like predict, we just know how they're thinking and they're feeling. But actually being curious, asking how they are in the moment. And right now in our present situation with the COVID-19 crisis, we can consider who what the crisis what the impact is having on people who are different to us what does the crisis look like for them what circumstances might they be facing at home or at work and how might that be shaping their views and opinions so those are a couple of things we can do i'm going to hand over to victoria who's going to talk uh, through the next part so from being curious with others to being curious with ourselves. This one might sound a bit strange. Um, uh, surely I am me. Why do I need to be? I know my story. Why do I need to be curious about that? But actually, we would suggest that there are a couple of really important reasons um, to be curious in our relationship with ourselves. 
One very important one is that it helps us discover our blind spots in our encounters with others. Just as we would ask, just as we need to ask others, what's your story? What are your experiences that have led to that view? We also need to ask ourselves that question. Would I, would I think that if my life had been different? Where is, where is that reaction coming from? And even just yesterday, um, in a difference of opinion, um, I found myself responding in a way that was unexpected to both of us. And, and I had to kind of be curious and think, oh, well, that is tapping into something else within me. And when we are curious about that, it makes us better at engaging with other people. Uh, and it helps us engage with humility. When we're curious about ourselves, we discover the value and the limitations of our own story. We realise that we other people, so we, we put other people in a box. We realise, oh yeah, I react in this way, or I assume this about the other person. Um, and we also discover that we are someone else's other. So to someone else, we might be quite threatening or different um, and we can only do that when we're curious about others and about ourselves. The two go hand in hand. So it matters because we need to discover our blind spots in our encounter with others. But being curious also matters because it can interrupt broken patterns within ourselves. And we talked a bit last week about how that broken relationship with ourselves, self-rejection, we can carry that into all of our other relationships and it can distort the way we see others, the way we see God, the way we interact in the world. How many of us can identify with St Paul in his letter to the Romans where he says, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And I just love that bit of scripture because so often I, I, I am that person thinking, I don't know why I'm in this unhelpful cycle. And when we find ourselves caught up in self-destructive behaviours or thought patterns, being curious enables us to take a step back like Paul does, he observes what's happening. And that seems to be a first step. When we see brokenness in ourselves, our instinctive response might be guilt or denial or anger. And these patterns of thought and behaviour can be so destructive. Whereas being curious breaks that cycle. It allows us to entertain the possibility that Maybe there's another way of seeing it, um, that other options are available. And when we're curious, we can move beyond the voice in our heads or the patterns in our behaviour and ask how God wants to shape us or how he sees us. So, if that's why it matters, um, how on earth can we do it? Well, um, Luke talked a bit about social media. Uh, or the news and when we're looking at our feeds uh, as well as asking what are the views I'm not seeing we can also ask ourselves oh how do I respond to that would I believe that if my life were different and we can get into the habit of asking ourselves those questions when we feel a reaction arising within us when our inner brokenness is most obvious to us. Again, we can just try and get into that habit of stepping back and observing it. And we might ask God, please tell me more about what is going on here. Or please help me to see this in a different way. Just getting into a rhythm of saying, oh, I wonder where this is coming from, can be really helpful. And the final thing to say about this is just that, obviously, it's not about having the answers. Being curious is much more about having the questions than having the answers. So I will hand back to Luke.
Brilliant. Thank you, Victoria. So I'm going to look at what it means to be curious with God. The famous author and pastor A.W. Tozer wrote, Lord, increase my curiosity and help me to know you so intimately that I am especially, specifically, consciously aware of your presence throughout the day. It's a powerful quote. And in praying in such a way, Tozer implies that having a greater curiosity about God leads us to a stronger awareness of his presence in our everyday comings and goings. When we feel distant or disappointed with God, we are likely to drop this posture of curiosity and our relationship with God can stop feeling alive. We're less aware of God at work. And we end up acting on the basis of our own views and ideas. Or we filter God through the lens of our own ideology. We just take the bits of God that make, uh, we feel comfortable with or reinforce our own experience. Sometimes these things can be damaging and they can prohibit our ability to see and experience the real living fullness of God. When we take the pressure off ourselves to understand everything, try and do everything in our own strength and come to God in curiosity, we're freed, liberated from our own ideas and we create the space to hear God above any other voice. Choosing to be curious about who God is and what he's doing acknowledges he's living and dynamic, that there's always more to discover. It invites God to speak to us. Scripture is constantly urging us to seek the Lord, to seek his face, to pursue authentic relationship. This idea of, of seeking suggests a curiosity that's active, not passive, like we were saying earlier on, and that draws us deeper in. In 1 Chronicles 16, it says, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his, uh, seek his face. And uh, in Matthew 6, Jesus urges us to seek first the kingdom of God. And the beautiful aspect of our relationship with God is that we're reciprocating a curiosity that's first shown to us. We see it uh, in Jesus's posture towards the disciples on the road to Emmaus and also at the very beginning of the Bible where God seeks out Adam and Eve, even as they're hiding from him. So how can we do it? How can we apply this to our lives? Well, there are a couple of things. Um, we can read the parts of scripture that we maybe we've never read before, or perhaps we haven't read for a very long time. Maybe we have made a conscious decision to avoid that part of the Bible because it makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but actually, let's ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us uh, through those parts of scripture to help us uh, gain wisdom and understanding about who God is through them. We can take time to stop and bring our questions to God in honest conversation. Um, and we can make this a regular practice. So we're not just going to God when we don't have answers, but God is actually like our first port of call in every situation, not just our last resort. And we can ask other people around us where they've seen God at work. Um, we're a global church, we're a body of Christ. How can we learn from each other? How can we see a bigger picture of who God is through interacting together, not limiting our understanding of God to our own experience? I'm going to hand over to Victoria, who's going to talk through the next part. So the final relationship that we're going to look at is um, the relationship with creation. And I think, as we've mentioned before, our relationship with creation can sometimes feel the least tangible um, and so being curious can be a way to really rediscover that as a relationship not just as a transaction um, we said that being curious acknowledges that the other has a story worth listening to um, and that's as true of creation as it is of our other relationships although it's different asking ourselves what we can learn from God's creation, how God's wisdom and love is present within it, 
can open up a new way of relating to God's world. There is a really beautiful um, passage in the Bible um, from the book of Job, which expresses this. And Job says, but ask the animals and they will teach you or the birds in the sky and they will tell you or speak to the earth and it will teach you or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. I love that image of ask the animals and they will teach you. And of course, this is not like Bambi or Snow White that they're going to come and whisper in your ear. Um, but it's that sense of I have something so much to learn from creation um, about who God is. Um, by being curious, we can see ourselves not as consumers, but as fellow creatures, people made by God, just as he has made the whole earth and everything in it. We might often uh, feel guilty about the ways we don't live up to our eco standards. And while it's healthy to um, want that relationship to be better, I think that guilt um, can sometimes close down or stifle the way we engage with the world. And by being curious rather than judgmental, we could reveal possibilities that we didn't think of before. So, you know what the next question is going to be and um, how can we do that and curiosity so often begins with um, choosing to notice choosing to look with fresh eyes so where do we where can we notice afresh maybe the the green spaces that we can see out the window or um, do we appreciate the air filling our lungs or some of the smells or the um, things that we can touch in the created world. That can really rediscover the joy of that relationship. If we struggle to make the choices we want to when it comes to looking after creation, we can be curious about that. Um, if we pray with other people, we might ask one another that question more regularly. Like, how can we how can we do that differently? And if we know or see someone who's made a choice that we would like to emulate, we can ask them, how did you manage to do that? How did, how did you do that? Um, and then we can ask ourselves, well, how much do I know about the world around me? How much do I know about where my food comes from or who made my clothes or how much do I know about the impact of the lifestyle of my culture on the cultures in other parts of the world? And we saw last week, um, there was a wonderful uh, quotation from someone called Archbishop Winston, which was getting at that idea that actually this is all of our problem and all of our opportunity. We can find out how climate change impacts others. So those are just a few of the ways we could maybe be curious in that relationship too. Brilliant, thank you, Victoria. So uh, we have looked across these four different relationships and how we can, why curiosity is important and how we can start to step into it. That's a bit of a whirlwind. So we're gonna take a bit of time to just stop and reflect. As we've considered this, what opportunities might you have to be curious this week? Whose story might you seek out? How might we begin to understand more of what has formed our own views and identity? And what can we learn from the creation that we live in? Those kinds of questions. So let's take two minutes to reflect on this question, bring before God, anything that's been stirring in you, and then we'll play a bit of music and then we'll move on to the next part of the webinar.
Well, um, this has been one of the bits I've been looking forward to most in this webinar. And that is um, the chance to hear some of the story of Canon Stephanie. Um, and Stephanie, I wonder, would you um, share with us maybe a little bit about who you are um, and how you've seen being curious as a spiritual practice? Um, mm -hmm. um, I've, I've actually written about this and certainly my own spiritual practice is deeply, deeply embedded in curiosity. I am, um, um, why would that be? I am, um, I think fundamentally that if we are all made in the image of God, which is a part of what you all were sharing earlier, then that means every person I encounter, I have an opportunity either to look at them and to say, I already know everything I need to know, or to look at them and to wonder, how is God going to bless me in my interaction with you? Is there something that God wants to reveal, some piece of wisdom, some truth, some gift of the spirit that I will only gain because I'm in relationship with you? Including if it's a tense relationship. <laughs> is there something in here that God is working out? Um, my spiritual practice really depends on me going around wondering, 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 um, not knowing. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing in my head Jesus saying, um, you know, saying in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. You know, that there's something really fundamental, I think, about our posture in the world as Christians and that if I say, oh, of course, God is in control, but really I'm the one who knows everything, <laughs> then actually God's not in control. I am. Uh, curiosity to me is the other side of that. Curiosity is, is what I exhibit, it's how I live as one who is listening, one who is wondering, one who is open, one who is dependent on God. Um, so that's some of what's going on for me when I, like why curiosity matters so much to me. Um, there's a theologian that I love and um, his name is Christopher DeRising. He taught me at Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, when I was training for priesthood. And he's from the church in South India. Beautiful, beautiful theologian. And he used to teach us about how um, the multi-voiced flower of the gospel, he would say, the multicolored flower of the gospel. And he used to tell us that each voice speaks of God. And when they do, it's each voice speaks one more petal of the gospel flower unfolds. And he told us, you will not see the fullness of the gospel until all the petals, all the colors, all the voices have unfolded and been acknowledged. Um, so, so that's what I feel like is happening when I am practicing curiosity. I am like a good Anglican practicing comprehensiveness. <laughs> um, knowing I can't possibly discern the mind of Christ on my own. I need you. I need what you know of the mind of Christ, even as I disagree tremendously <laughs> with you or you or you or you. I still need what you know of the mind of Christ. So that's, that's the spiritual, the formation really element of that for me. Thank you so much. Um, and I wonder where you've seen the value of being curious in mm. your context. Oh boy. <laughs> um, all the time. I, am, I used to be a journalist. And um, I think that, that who knows if I became a journalist and then I got curious. Or I think I was always curious and ended up becoming a journalist before I was a priest. And as a journalist, I was just my job was to go around asking questions, wondering, wondering, wondering. Um, and, and I also just think that it was a part of my life, and in particular as an African-American from the southern part of the USA. Um, you know, that I, I, I've spent my entire life surrounded by people, honestly, with whom I disagree. People who didn't believe that I should be talking, and some of them probably didn't believe that I should be living or doing whatever it was that I was doing. 
So I think I had to decide early on in life, would I answer their, um, their limited way of living with an equally limited mind? In other words, they're shutting me up, so I'm going to shut them up. So there. And I think early on, something in me got activated that said, no, you know, like an eye for an eye you know, leaves both of us blind. And if, if I'm not curious about them, if I'm not open to them, then they'll never be open to me and they'll never be open to anybody else. So, um, so I think that's probably part of where I learned that really early in life. Um, a time that it became really where I consciously had to practice that was um, ooh, 2016 <laughs> or right into 2017, um, which I know for folk in England, you all were going through Brexit and we were going through the election of Donald Trump as our president. And of course, I, you know, <laughs> More than half of Americans didn't want him to be our president. <laughs> so I, I feel safe saying that I did not agree with him and I do not agree with him, <laughs> like the majority of Americans. Sorry. So, <laughs> um, but I am um, right after his election, I think we were so clear that we had staked out our camp. And there was a lot of hatred, and there still is a lot of hatred between these political groups, these ideological groups here in the States. And um, but one day I was at a I was at a bar and it was pretty soon after the election. I'm sitting down next to a man, he's probably in his maybe seventies, um, white man. And um, you know it's happy hour. We're just kind of hanging, and somehow it comes up that he had voted for Trump and I had not. And immediately he said, "Well, I guess that's the end of this conversation. There's nothing I can say now that you want to hear." And Part of me said, you're right. <laughs> I don't understand why you did that. I don't want to talk to you. But and again, who knows why it was in me. But I, I, another part of me, uh, the part that won said, we could do this differently. And so I just said to him, like, actually, sir, I, I do want to be in this conversation with you. Just while we're hanging out. Um, not because I want to fix you. But just because I want to hear you, I'm, I'm curious, not patronizing curious, but just genuinely curious. And he kind of sat back and he's like, really? And I was, I sat back and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I actually do. And so we started just kind of sharing with each other. And ultimately he shared with me the story of his daughter and shared two stories, actually. One was the story of his daughter and how she had applied for college and, um, she got into this great school, the school of her dreams. They didn't have money to send her. She didn't get a scholarship. And he was convinced that the reason his daughter didn't get the scholarship was because a black person got that scholarship and made it impossible for his daughter to go to that school. So he feels extraordinary resentment um, toward people of color who have taken what he saw as, um, as what, what was due him, what was due his children, because he had worked hard and he didn't feel like somebody else had worked as hard as they had. Uh, I did not change his mind in that conversation. I shared with him how I went to college on scholarship. Um, and I shared with him the number of people in my family who had never been able to dream of college because those doors had been shut to African Americans for most of our history in this country. Um, I didn't say that to him so that I could get him to my side. I shared it with him as a part of sharing my story. Um, and what I hope is that maybe somewhere in his life, he's sitting with somebody talking and saying, you know, I talked to this, this black woman priest and you know, she voted for Hillary Clinton, but she listened to me. And then I get the chance to say, I met this guy who's unlike anybody else I know. But here's what was going on for him. Here's how his heart was broken. And that broken heart is what's led him where he is. I want to know why all of our hearts are broken, because I feel like if I'm curious about that, I'm going to get at something real. And maybe we can be a part of helping to heal one another. And that's reconciliation, the deep work of reconciliation. 
Wow, that is that is such a an amazing story. Mm. Yeah, and I guess it, it leads me to the question of how you manage to stay curious in tough situations. Mm. What enables you to do that? Mm -hmm. Well, and I saw in the uh, in the chat box someone asked a question like this earlier. They said, "How can you retain peaceful curiosity with others?" if they are resistant or obstructive or shut communication down. So talk about a tough situation, right? <laughs> um, I mean, in a way, I think that the example that I just cited, you know, is one of those instances. You know, the man at the bar, the conversation began with him saying, I guess you don't want to have a conversation with me, do you? He shut it down before it even started. <laughs> or as soon as it ventured in that direction, as soon as we weren't just talking about the bourbon selection, but we're talking about <laughs> things that really mattered. Um, he was like, okay, conversation over. It's not going to go anywhere. We're just going to fight. And I had to really go deep and, again, not just to say the words, but to believe it in my heart that actually, sir, could we try this differently? I would actually like to see if, we may end up fighting, but I'd like to see if there's another way that we could do this. Do you want to try that out with me? And so I think in that instance, we end up with two different ways that you're being curious. The first is curiosity about that person, but it's also curiosity about what's the shape of a relationship between us. So I had to be curious about what was possible with us. Do you see what I mean? I had to hold out the option that maybe we weren't destined to hate or even destined to fight, but that there might be another way. And I invited him to join me in that wondering. So I invited him to be curious. And it turned out that he was willing. Not everyone is. Um, there are some people who, are, um, who feel threatened, who feel scared. There are some times when you may be the one who needs you may be the one who needs to draw a line. There may have been verbal violence and even physical violence from another person toward you. And then you need to discern, is this a tough situation where I need to stay present and curious? Or do I need to practice my curiosity from a safer distance? Um, that discernment, I think, is a part of, that's life. That's, um, and we all have different places where we're comfortable, I think, based on our life experiences. What I've shared before is that um, maybe because I grew up in the 70s in the South, I heard the N word just as a part of, you know, people talking. And it was hurtful, but it wasn't, when I hear it today, it is not devastating for me the way that it is for, honestly, some of my younger colleagues who didn't grow up hearing that and grow up, they didn't kind of get the thicker skin that others of us had to develop out of necessity. So when they hear that N word, I can watch as it just, something in them shrivels, something in them um, is destroyed. I would not ask someone going through that experience, but stay and be curious, you know, stay in that space, even when someone is using language like that toward you, like, no, you need to go. <laughs> um, again, find another way to be, to be curious, to be present. Um, so discern what, what is the test situation. Discern what God is calling you to in that moment. Again, be curious with God. Ask God, do you want me here? Is there anything, God, that you can do with me in this place? Is there anything you can do with me, God, in this relationship? And it may be that God is really saying, I got something else planned for you right now. Or it may be that God says, stay, I'm protecting you. Even though this is tough, I've got you. So be curious with God in that way too. Does that help? It definitely helps me. I think that's, yeah, mm. so much to go away and... Yeah. Um, just finally, I don't know if there's any more, anything, anything else about curiosity that just excites you or that you would love to share. Mm. 
Um, but I think you can tell that I, like, I'm so grateful to be on this call with you all, first of all. I'm so grateful for the invitation because, um, again, curiosity really is, like, I just, I, I believe that the world would be different. And actually, I believe that Christians would be different in the world if we practiced more curiosity. Um, I think that, you know, as I look at the differences between us, and again, some of those differences are going to remain. They're not going to change because one person listened to another person. Sometimes they will. Sometimes that story is just the one and that presence is just the thing that helps to transform um, not only the relationship, but maybe heal whatever another person was experiencing that made them need to believe what they believed. Um, but um, so, yeah, I think I would just, I would simply offer that, um, you know, that, that this really is a core practice, a core habit. And maybe the other thing I'll mention is that it's a habit that Jesus embodies for us. Um, there are two passages that I love, and I just want to name these. And so if anybody's going deeper with this practice of curiosity and this habit, um, and you want to see a little more of how our Lord um, has embodied this and how the early disciples did, two things I want to point out. One is, and you've already heard the road to Emmaus, um, I love um, the, the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well and how Jesus practices curiosity in that moment where he's with her and says, you know, give me a drink. And there's something about, you know, I want a drink and him turning and saying, can I have it from you, sister? Like, that's really what was happening. And of course, the disciples and even she, who are you know the disciples watching, and she are all like, "That's not the way this works. <laughs> you don't ask me a question. You don't talk to me." Um, and instead, Jesus did. He opens up a whole conversation with this woman, this Samaritan woman. They should not have been talking. <laughs> like in our world, it's hard to imagine this, but like. Think of the most intractable divides you can and now place Jesus on one side of that, Samaritan woman on the other side of it, and then picture in the heat of the day, full light, everybody able to see it. He goes to that well and says, hey, can you give me a drink? And hey, what do you know about God? And she's asking him questions and he's sharing with her and um. And he's embodying that for the disciples who are watching, who again must have thought, well, we know everything there is to know about Samaritans, whatever. And Jesus is, is at the well telling them, actually, there's something deeper here. There's something that even a Samaritan, especially a Samaritan, has to teach you. Um, when I'm gone, you keep coming and practicing this. So that's John chapter 4, verses I think, 7 to, um, I guess there's some skipping, but 7 to 30. And then another passage that I just, oh, my favorite, my favorite is Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. <laughs> um, please sit with this for your practice of reconciliation, evangelism, just being a follower of Jesus. Follow what Philip did um, in Acts 8, verses 26 to 37, I think where the Spirit tells Philip, go after that chariot and join it. And Philip has no idea, <laughs> but he goes, he runs up to the chariot, and he finds this, this Ethiopian eunuch, and they just open up this wonderful time together, and Philip asks him, hey, what you reading? What you reading? You know, <laughs> People are waiting for Christians to be curious like that. Instead, we jump in and we say, oh, I have things to tell you. <laughs> you're wrong, but I'm about to fix you. Nobody wants to hear that. That's not reconciling behavior. That's not humility. That's not attractive. Um, but for Philip to, to say, hey, what you reading? And then the Ethiopian eunuch says, well, I've got this. I'm not completely sure what, what it's about. And they break it open together, both of them wondering side by side. And then eventually it's the eunuch who says, hey, I see water. Can I get baptized? And I'm sure Philip is like, well, I, I think the answer is no. <laughs> and yet, you know, they have this adventure together. Neither of them could have anticipated it. But it's because Philip was curious. 
the spirit planted that curiosity in him. And look what happened. So may we be, be launched by the spirit with curiosity in the same way. Amen to that. Thank you so much. Um, before mm-hmm. I fade into utter darkness, um, I am going to turn on a light in my, uh, my end. I know. <laughs> um, thank you so much, uh, Stephanie. This has just been such a, an enriching conversation. Um, I'm going to hand over um, back to Luke and turn on the light. Brilliant. Well, I mean, shout out to the gorgeous sunset on Victoria's was wall. It's, it's putting my background to shame. Um, but yes, again, just repeating my thanks, Stephanie. That was uh, so fantastic. And just a reminder to people, because there was a lot of gold in what Stephanie said, that you can watch this back on YouTube. Um, it'll be up tomorrow. And you can find the link to that on our website, on the webinar page. And my encouragement to you, we're going to come into a time of Q&A in just a second, is to take from this webinar what is really useful to you, what's going to help you in your everyday practice. This isn't about going away with a to-do list, like, oh gosh, right, I need to do this, 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 and this. We want it to be the opposite of that. We want it to help you find a framework and an understanding for some of the stuff you're already doing and some of the ways you can build these habits and practices into your life. Mm And, you know, one of the really wonderful things about curiosity is it doesn't have limits. And when we start it, it often leads us to places we couldn't have imagined. When we're curious about one of those types of relationships, it so often leads us to curiosity across a whole spectrum of different things. So we've now got time um, for some of the questions that you have been asking as we've been going along, maybe some that you've submitted in advance as well. And I'm going to invite uh, Kira, another member of our team, to uh, just share some of the questions that you've written. Kira. Thank you, everyone. So I have gathered a few questions um, from the Q&A. And to start with, um, some of them are paraphrased because we've got a few similar ones. Um, but Stephanie, this one has a couple of people have asked which is how do we find or create safe spaces to nurture difference or curiosity? Hmm. How do we find or create safe spaces for nurturing curiosity? And again, I think it comes to some of what I was saying around that discernment, Um, discerning for yourself, like what's safe for someone else is not safe for another. And so I think everybody has to, um, to kind of do their own internal check-in. That's, that's important. I can't tell someone, well, but this is safe, you know? <laughs> um, because they may not be for them. Um, I think what we can do is create, uh, one of my colleagues, Eric Law, here in the USA, he's, he travels all over and teaches all over. He's an Asian American theologian Um, beautiful, beautiful work he does on multicultural organizational development. And he has great tools for for creating a gracious space. He says a gracious space for sharing. And he's created these um, just kind of ground rules, really, for how do you set up a space for a conversation where people can share and not um, at least avoid that experience of being attacked because they are revealing things that are vulnerable and tender. Um, because maybe they are sharing a part of their own broken heart. You know, I'm not, I'm not big on sharing my broken heart if I don't know that you are going to tend it well. <laughs> so Eric Law, I find, has beautiful tools for um, just kind of, you know, like there's a covenant, really, that you can set at the opening of a conversation, if it's a group, if you're creating that safe space. A covenant that you can use, and I'll put um, I'll put a link in the chat box so that you can check out his work for yourselves. But yeah, a grace, a space for grace, a space for grace, and so there are ways of creating that space. I'll I'll put the link in right now. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Luke, could you talk to us about um how? we uh, can be curious about those that are living with mental health challenges without being patronizing or nosy? Yeah, sure. I I think um, so much of it, again, comes down to our intention. Like, you know, are we 
are we seeking out that person's story and also i think you know god um you know god promised us promises us he will speak to us by his holy spirit when we have these encounters so i think not going in with these are my list of tick box questions i'm going to ask to elicit someone's story from them and I think the other thing I would say is that curiosity doesn't always look like directly asking people questions. Sometimes it is about um, holding someone in your mind and considering what it might uh, look like to have that person's experience. Um, and if it's uh, someone suffering with um, some mental health challenges, perhaps that's also reading up, understanding a little bit about what they might be uh, going through to give yourself that uh, sensitivity as you go into those conversations. Thanks. And Stephanie, could you speak to us about how you foster cross-cultural curiosity? There. Okay. I just I just added that uh that link for everybody. I just found, tracked that down. Um. So can you say that question again? Um. It's about fostering cross-cultural curiosity. Mm, yes. Yes. And of course. Actually, the, the link that I just sent you is great for that. So, um, Eric Law's work. Um, I think we can foster, a lot of my work actually is on this very thing, um, fostering that cross-cultural um, curiosity. I find that fundamentally when I am involved in work with people who say they want diversity, I get a little nervous because I think that if what I want is diversity, then, then it becomes acquisitive, if that makes sense. It becomes something where I want, I want that person, that person, that group, that group. I want representatives from all of these, kind of like a menagerie that you can kind of like admire and be like, look at everything I've collected. Uh, <laughs> if it's that kind of diversity, I don't want any part in that. Um, what I want is and I think what we can invite one another into is to genuinely note what is there in my own life that, what is my longing? What is my own deep, deep longing? And how is it that this other person or this other culture may know something that, that grows me, something that completes me? Um, if I just want you around, that's one thing. But if I, if I am curious about how it is that God means to, to grow me through something that you have mastered, that you are really amazing at, or your culture is really amazing at, that's different. Um, here's an example. So a lot of people... Um, get upset when, um, when, say, a white group will sing gospel music and there are no black people or other people of color around. What I always say is, like, okay, so if someone's just acquiring, like, they like the sound of it and now they're going to, to reproduce gospel music without much curiosity about where it comes from, the experiences that, that gave life to that, why these cries um, of the spirit came forth from people, you know, from my culture. If you're not curious about that, then probably I'm like, yeah, like, sure, you can listen to gospel. And, you know, I'm not going to stop anybody, but I feel like there's a lot. Um, but if someone is, is listening to gospel and singing gospel, um, and it's not their home culture, but they hear something of liberation in that. And they know that they've yearned for liberation too. And that's why they're crossing over. To me, that's an opening, you know? That's, that's, that's something we can work with. So to me, cross-cultural dialogue and cross-cultural um, curiosity becomes a real gift when it's rooted in, you know, my own yearning, honestly. Um, I think a part of what empire, I hope I'm not going over here, um, part of what empire does is empire gets to stomp around the planet, around the world, 
acting as if it is giving to everyone and receiving nothing, or that it is it is taking from everyone what they have, but then using it the way that empire has decided. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I'm on the call with folks in the Church of England, but <laughs> um, I feel like America does that. Like we, we function as an empire today as well. Um, the reverse of that, to, kind of to decolonize that, is to go saying, you know, there are a lot of ways that European culture, that white culture, that American culture is broken. I'm curious what, what Latin American cultures, plural, have to teach us. I'm curious what my brothers and sisters in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Ghana have to teach my culture. Um, I'm like, that's, that's true cross-cultural curiosity. Thanks, Stephanie. Because of time, I'll read out two questions and then I'll, I'll hand over to you guys, which one is, um, can you be curious and arrogant? Like, and how do you not come across with predetermined opinions? So that's one. And then um, for the difference course training, is it only available in the UK um, or is there any training online? Shall I jump in with the um, the first question you asked about um, whether you can be curious and arrogant? Um, I suppose the answer is yes. If it's not a healthy curiosity, if it's that sort of passive curiosity that is, as Stephanie has said, that is acquisitive, that's like, I want to have these experiences, um, then I guess it's it's quite possible. I think... I think it, it is quite difficult to be arrogant and to be curious in a way that um, builds relationship with others. Um, I think the very thing that curiosity does is that it, it pushes out the space for um, arrogance and, and it, it creates the space for humility. Uh, and it's that humility that is so much of what builds connection because it makes the other person feel safe. It makes the other person feel that, yeah, you, you're interested in their story. So it's worth them taking the risk of sharing that with you. So that, that would be my response to that. Um, I might hand over to Luke about the, the second question. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I love that, that there's appetite to train to, to run the course internationally. Uh, we are so so open to those conversations so um it's definitely something that we are considering that we've begun work doing uh we've we actually ran some online training for a group of churches in austin texas uh back in march which was good fun it was our first time doing some remote training online so it's definitely something we want to consider and also you know something we're gonna have to think about like right now in the uk as well as we're all you know in lockdown not able to meet face to face so um if you're if you're interested in that please do get in touch with us you can get in touch with us at hello at rln.global hello at rln.global um and we'd love to have that conversation with you that'd be brilliant okay um, so thank you so much for all of those uh, questions, for bringing your engagement, from, for bringing your own curiosity. It's been absolutely uh, brilliant to see. Um, I would encourage you all to go and follow Stephanie on Twitter. It's, is it at S Spellers, Stephanie? Actually, I'm better on Facebook. I'm, I'm rotten on Twitter, I admit <laughs> it. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Well, yeah, we just want to champion you and raise your profile and mm. thank you so, so much for all you have done in, and brought to this webinar. Um, I just wanted to share with everybody what our next webinar is going to look like. That is next Tuesday at the time of 3 p.m. UK time this time around. And that is on our, our next habit, be present. And we're going to explore how engaging our whole unique self can help us in deepening our encounters. 
and we're really excited to have an, another guest speaker at that webinar, Mariam Tadros. I believe Mariam's actually uh, watching this webinar as well. So hi, Mariam. <coughs> we we're looking forward to having you. Mariam is the technical specialist for peace building at Tear Fund. So we're so delighted to be having her next week for that one. Please do sign up and come along. I'd love to close this our time together by just uh, offering this prayer for us all. We call it the encounter prayer. Um, please do use it as a resource for when uh, you are facing encounters that you might find challenging or ones that you might feel very familiar with. Um, this is a gift to you. Feel free to take a picture of it with your phone if it's useful for you to use in your other encounters. Shall we pray now? So loving God, fill us with your spirit now. Help us to be curious about others' stories, listening as often as we speak. Give us the courage to be present, engaging our whole and unique selves. And inspire us to reimagine what's possible, finding hope by glimpsing you at work. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm. Amen. God bless you. Have a fantastic week. I hope you've enjoyed this evening and we will see you next time. Goodbye. God bless you all. Peace.